tradition of staying within uh, uh, very active in neighborhood and city politics, and we've taken it to podcast form. And we have our two mighty hosts here uh, with us tonight. We have Maureen Hanlon. She is a third-year law student at St. Louis University, a native of the great state of Michigan. Oh, yeah, I forgot I should pull, pull that up there a little bit. Okay. And then, of course, we also have Michael Allen, a uh, particularly potent man around town. Uh, okay. <laughs> He is a uh, he is a uh, historian. He is a uh, he stays in touch with everything, um, and he has a, a website called. Which one do you have? You have a few. Michael dash Allen dot org. Okay, is where everything is. You'll find everything is now. I've, I've keep followed tabs. You, I followed you through several different right. uh, websites over the years, and um, he's been hosting on the Royal Political Wire for I don't know how we've been doing this since last spring or something. Hmm. Well, you've been doing only you've, that long. <laughs> well, you've been uh, you've been hosting our many debates that we've had over the years, right, right, um, for years now, really. And we've had some people, other people involved in that as well. It's been a great tradition here at the Royale. And right now, we are partnering uh, with uh, Next STL, the website nextstl.com, a uh, great source of information of how things are cooking around this town. It's kind of expanding, and we are going into the media level of this. And um, today, today, tonight, we also have our very special guest is Paul Thaler. He is a resident in this neighborhood, third generation St. Louisan. He is also an expert in geography. You may have seen his maps online, usually breaking down elections here in the city of St. Louis. He's a 12-year resident of the 8th Ward and has been a committeeman now for a while and been very active in the 8th Ward Democrats, something that I will say I was for a while until... I somehow became a member of the 10th Ward. I don't know how that happened after redistricting. But uh, I'm no longer in the 8th Ward. Somebody asked why we didn't have the, uh, why we're doing this not in the 8th Ward. I'm like, well, we were in the 8th Ward. That's, but I've been kicked out. So, but regardless. You and Sharon Tayas are still <laughs> the most bitter people. Yes, yes, we are. Um, okay, so I'll lean it over to the, uh, the hosts here. Let me make sure here. Michael, why don't you start on the talking? I'm going to check a microphone here. All right. Well, just a reminder, the election is Tuesday, February 13th. It's too late to register, but um, it's very early to um, think through who you're voting for. The other candidate is independent, Annie Rice, who we interviewed last week. That podcast is up on Next STL. Election day will be, again, Tuesday the 13th, or as the Royale calls it, Tinder Tuesday. Perhaps because during the election you decide, in this case between two Democrats, which way left you might be swiping. It might influence your Valentine's Day plans, to be honest. No, our plan is actually to uh, have white tablecloths, violin players for all of the poll workers. It's going to be the most romantic <laughs> uh, election date anyone's ever seen in the city of St. Louis. Just rose pe petals scattered. We will spare no expense. Okay. All right. Wow. I like to hear that. As an Eighth Ward voter, I expect to walk down kind of like a red... Path I will bring that roses. to you. Great. And, and it's great to uh, be with a uh, current constituent, a uh, former constituent, right. and a former or a fellow former committee man. Uh, Green Party committee man, yes. yes You've done your homework. From the, from the mighty 23rd Ward and the mighty 14th Ward. Excellent. Yes. Excellent. All right. So shall we start? Yeah, I think we shall start. So, Paul. What would you list as the greatest legislative accomplishment of the Board of Aldermen in the past 10 years? Greatest legislative accomplishment of the Board of Aldermen in the last 10 years? Yeah. What comes to mind? Well, there's a confirmation bias that uh, springs uh, with the things. I, I really think that the history of St. Louis is formed by uh, these great ideas that come true or don't come true. There's the greatest legislative accomplishment might have been something that we voted down. I mean, nothing springs to mind. What, what ideas do you have about greatest legislative accomplishment? Well, so here's my question for you. Does it bother you that you can't immediately think of the greatest legislative accomplishment mm -hmm. of the Board of Aldermen? Truthfully, it probably does, yes. Okay. So I, I've noticed one thing about you is that you do have the support of a fair number of players in the political establishment right now. Correct? 
Who uh, who are you thinking of? I believe you have Steve Conway's support. Is that true? He's uh, civil service. He oh, can't he's public civil use. service. That's so true. Okay. So my apologies, Royal viewers, or Royal podcast. So um, who else were you thinking of? Of other endorsements that you have. I believe sure. you have several of the union endorsements. Yes. Correct. Um, Very thankful for that as well. Peter Meredith's endorsement. Yes. Correct. You obviously are the Democrat. Michael Butler's as well. Michael Butler's as well. You have you are the Democratic nom- nominee yes. for the award. Correct. So I'm, I'm wondering what, when you think about kind of being endorsed by some of these players, but then also maybe wanting, as you said, Maybe some things are bothering you, or maybe some of these, maybe it does bother you that you can't think of a major legislative accomplishment, or there are things that you have in mind, like these are things that I've been observing as a committee man or a resident that I want to change. Tell me how you're planning to navigate those relationships. I think it's very important to have uh, a broad base of support. Uh, I, I don't know that I have the support of any establishment, quote unquote, but I think I have a broad support from a wide geographic range of places. It's not. It's simply not enough to come to the Board of Aldermen with simply good ideas. You must also have a way to move the ball down the field. You have to have these relationships in order to accomplish anything. Uh, one of the biggest letdowns I could have for my constituents is to have all the good ideas in the world and have nobody that will help me to advance them. Speaking of other ideas, um, <clears throat> There are a lot of, or several now, young progressive or progressive leaning older persons, north and south. Yes. Um, who off the bat do you think you might find sympathetic to your point of view? I would somebody say on the board you're really excited about serving next to. Sure. I, I, would, I have, uh, if not the outward support, very good relationships with all of them, mm-hmm. or, or everyone that I imagine you would list of these uh, young progressives. Mm-hmm. I'm looking forward to working with every single one of them, including uh, working with the people who've been there quite a while. I was very impressed, especially in the Major League uh, Soccer Stadium uh, thing with the with Ogilvy. And Ogilvy and I have not always agreed factually on every single thing. I just think that he did a fantastic showing. He has a well-deserved reputation for thoroughly reading every single thing. Uh, you can't sneak anything by him. He does the work. Uh, you know, I would see myself in that vein or maybe even giving myself too much credit. But there's not one of them that I wouldn't look forward to mm-hmm. working with. Well, the, the follow-up then, um, Ogilvy is someone who reads everything. Absolutely. And if you read everything, you'd probably be good on certain committees where details are hashed out. We know the president of the Board of Aldermen has a lot of influence. You put in your request, the president decides to shuffle the cards. Absolutely. Ogilvy got shuffled off of Ways and Means recently, a p- position where a lot of us thought he was doing very good good things for the city mm. assuming you could get what you want and where do you want to land in terms of committees you seem like the kind of person who might already have an answer to that absolutely yes ways and means ways and means you ways, want to and be means. ways and means absolutely uh which is not to say that i you know you can't come swinging haymakers uh on any uh, uh committee that you're put on uh but that's where i would like to end up and there's a lot of learning that i could do there, but you know, we're our city's in a financial crisis. It's absolutely the case that we need uh, men and women that will keep close tabs on that. That's crucially important. Mm-hmm. So, give us some examples of some haymakers you're trying to throw. Uh, it, it, so, what are your ideas? What would you come in with? for ways and means? Yeah, uh, fiscal responsibility is a haymaker I'd like to throw. Uh, uh, undoing two credit downgrade in the last 16 months is something I'd like to throw. I mean, it is a case, you know, the, the, there's various ways to judge a city's economic vitality. One is, uh, you know, unallocated general revenue over operating expense, which, you know, most federal regulators would say that it's, it's essentially, and you measure it in time. It's the amount of time that we could operate uh, current city services with our unallocated general revenue. So uh, some people call it a rainy day fund. It's not strictly that, but that's a good way to think about it. So a, a fiscally healthy city should be able to operate for 60 days for two months. Uh, city of St. Louis can operate for five days on our unallocated general revenue. That's not the only way to figure out the fiscal health of a city, but that's a very important way. We need to be more fiscally healthy. So ways and means is where I would like to end up. That doesn't mean I have every answer right away, but this is something that we all should be thinking about. Um, To that end, I suppose, um, do you think a fiscally healthy city can afford to 
give up potential revenues from the seventh fastest growing airport in the country by I, leasing it to a private party. I do not think that that would be a wise decision. I am very much against airport, airport privatization, even without the scheme in which it's trying to be evinced now. Mm -hmm. uh, I have two issues. One is with the idea of airport privatization. The other is how it's being handled. I'm against both. So talk to us a little bit about the way that you've seen other aldermen kind of lobby the mayor's office when it comes to the airport privatization scheme. Like, do you think that's been effective currently? Are there steps you would take that maybe you don't see played out right now? I'm entirely unfamiliar with how aldermen have lobbied the mayor's oh, office okay. with that. Yeah. You know, I think several, you know, there was kind of a coalition of aldermen that came together to kind of voice some of the same concerns that I think sure. you're raising. And I think that goes to a little bit to the kind of coalition view you were talking about. So I think, um, I think most of our listeners are probably aware of some of the work you've done professionally before, but do you want to talk just a little bit about some of how you came to be familiar with, you know, sure. how did you come to start making Absolutely. these maps? Yeah. So my, my uh, academic background is in geography, specifically GIS and demographics uh, and spatial statistics. I worked uh, immediately out of school uh, for a software company called ESRI. Didn't particularly enjoy it, but I got into documentary filmmaking. Uh, which I did enjoy. And we made two films, uh, one of which was successful and the other which uh, absolutely bombed and ate up all the success the first one had. But I had the opportunity to move back to St. Louis, which was a priority of mine, to work on a film called The Pruitt I Go Myth, which is a film about a uh, ill-fated housing project built in the 1950s and uh, demolished in the course of the early 1970s. That brought me back to St. Louis uh, I searched long and hard to find a movie that would match or top it and could not find that. Uh, it, I couldn't find anything that would have brought me the satisfaction uh, that that film did. I, I call it my love letter to my city. And during the course of filming that, I was uh, made aware of uh, many women that had jumped from the tenant affairs boards and the uh, uh, organizations uh, for into politics. I, the, politics was something I was never particularly interested in, especially in national politics. And then when I found that these people had made this leap, I was immediately just taken with local politics and Jeff City state level politics. I was inspired then to uh, pivot. So, you know, now I work in data analysis, which is more, which is closer to the, what I was trained in. I uh, have not done film work. I, I leave that to Bill Streeter. Uh, he, he does a, a, a fantastic work, and uh, now it, it's analysis, uh, data analysis, which some people get excited about, and it bores some people to tears. So, Why do you I, think so many of those women jumped from the tenant affairs boards into politics? What do you think was, like, the support there? I wish I knew, but, you know, when I'm talking about this, I'm, I'm talking about Ruby yeah. Russell, and I'm talking about Betty Thompson, I'm talking about Bertha Gilkey. There were all these people that saw an underserved community, but saw a great concentration of political strength yeah. and saw in that an opportunity to, as an outsider, as somebody who, uh, you know, not from a political family, not from uh, anywhere, you know, saw a need and saw a group of people who could be, you know, they, who could commit to, to addressing that. And it didn't always work fantastically, but I just admire the spirit. Do you think that St. Louis is able to tap some of that? Do you think St. Louis is tapping some of that political power right now statewide or do you think that's not really happening? no i think that we're uh we're absolutely leveraged we're not we're we're less relevant statewide from from their perspective than we ever have been it used to be the case you know that we uh we would send our uh young men and all too infrequently young women uh to jeff city and just enforce our mandate and then yeah. there was a time 20 years ago where we would send our young men and it still too infrequently our young women to jeff city and say well, do your best. And now, you know, we say a prayer over them and we paint them in war paint and we say, go absolutely f fight for us. There's, there's no, uh, since the Republican supermajority in Jeff City, it is not the case that uh, our needs are being met. Uh, and and that's, through, that's through no fault of the fantastic representatives that we send there because we, we send absolute people that go to war for us. So there's no problem with that. It's just that we're not relevant in state politics and we need to fix that. I want to follow up um, because you said you're not, you weren't particularly interested in national politics, but your second documentary was on the subject of presidential impersonators. So I want to bring that up. That was true. And uh, also a really great documentary. I, I appreciate uh, that, Michael. Michael is one of uh, four people in the country who has seen <laughs> the documentary First Impersonator. Right. 
Uh, it, it if was, you're interested in Von Meter, it's yeah, a it's, film for it's, you. It's a, <laughs> uh, and and, and I, I thank you for that. I was actually really proud uh, of that film. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's available on Amazon Prime. Right. But following up on 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 the, the the relevance of the city and the state level, it seems sometimes that there is not much of a legislative agenda coming out of City Hall, be it the Board of Aldermen and the Presidency or the Mayor's Office, that they're kind of, they seem, you know, hectic and trying to keep the city machine running and they don't really pay much attention to what's happening in Jefferson City unless it's an assault on the city, an assault on a tax credit program. But in the past, as I think you pointed out, there's been more cohesion and even, you know, the Democratic Party running state government for many decades, benefiting St. Louis as, as someone who studied history, do you think there's a mayor in the past who was particularly effective at the sort of synergy between state policy and, and local policy? Well, I met with Mayor Shamel this morning, so mm -hmm. would it be uh, too, uh, too on the nose for me to say? I mean, that, that, that's what comes to mind. I also right. think that uh, Jim Conway was a, 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 you know, pretty fantastic at that. But these, this is all conjecture, and this is all uh, stories that I've heard third-hand uh, right. through the line. You know, I, if I've been paying very close attention to city politics for about eight years. My memory is uh, very strong with that, and then past then it goes into the there be dragons kind of uh, <laughs> land of myth. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, have, you, have you read the uh, Stein's book? The, yes, Stein's book. Uh, or in, and also her occasional papers and, some, and several other things. That's been a huge... I take those two, like the old heads that know, mm -hmm. and I... And I cross-reference those uh, and, and I've created the mythology of how St. Louis politics has worked but it, it, this is not something I know firsthand or not something that many people in this room can know firsthand. I find it fascinating right. but it's all conjecture. There, there are two mayoral autobiographies too from John yes. F. Darby Mr. back in the 1840s. I've not and read. I will take Alfonso another. Cervantes in the 1960s. Mr. Mayor which yes. I've read. Yeah. So. Wait, wait, what's the name of the first one? Uh, Personal Notes by John F. Darby. I can lend you my copy if you ever want to borrow it. I will <laughs> take you up on that. So something else. Did you like the Mayor Cervantes one? I think the first it's third of it, the autobiographical amazingly part. Amazingly entertaining. Yes. Especially when um, yes. he talked about announcing his first bid for office at Columbus Tavern at 3130 South Keys yes. Highway. The third part of it lapses ah. into like apologia, I feel like. The yes. third part of it is just kind of like shoring up his, oh, it's uh, his, it's like, his, yeah. his apology his for... His legacy making. Like, yes. Oh, I actually tried to solve the race problem. I actually solved, tried to right. solve Pruitt, I go. Right. You no, know, and that's, that's what uh, brought it to my attention first and foremost. But if anybody is... Uh, I mean, go find it on Amazon used. And, and if you put it down after the first half of it, you'll still be very entertained. It's a fantastic book. Yeah, it's a lot of local color. Mm -hmm. A lot of names in and out. Yes. And he was a bare-knuckle guy. So Absolutely. Won a cab company and a poker game. If that doesn't send you out <laughs> to look uh, up the thing, I don't know what will. If, if, if I, I don't know. If you want to read about a mayor of St. Louis that won a cab company in a poker game, go look that book up. Right. But another thing on policy, and I just I, I, not to, to take up too much of time, but um, just to circle back to the board of aldermen. You know, we sure. have we have mayor, we have state level, we have things that do happen and don't happen, and a lot of people wring their hands about that. Uh, one of the biggest issues in local politics, at least by the amount of attention on social media and in the Riverfront Times and the Post Dispatch, is tax incentives for building redevelopment. I think there's a lot of attention for that and for a good reason. That's something that we have to consider. I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm curious about your general thoughts in the, the Eighth Ward, but one specific thing I also want to ask about is um, a couple, in December there was a board bill, Board Bill 198 from Alderman Volmer, and we're in the Tenth Ward, so Steve, I hope you don't get you in any trouble to bring this up on the show, but uh, he proposed um, a luxury, uh, abatement for luxury townhomes so their property taxes would be one hundred less than $160 a year for these, you know, half a million dollar townhouses. Team TIFF was was adamantly against it. Several aldermen criticized it, but when it went to final vote, only Sharon Tyus voted against it. Hmm. Mm. So well, if one person was going to one person voted against it, but uh, Megan Green, others you might expect, sure voted for it. I'm not familiar at all with so the, with the specifics of Board Bill 198, but it I is. guess my larger question is, you know, okay. par part of the fiscal sort of responsibility of an alderman is not just the incentives they may or may not approve for their own ward, but the overall <laughs> level of incentives. So would you be the one who would dare to vote against a board bill like that. Sure, I agree 100%. Uh, it, like, there needs to be a, a radical reimagining of how we use ticks, the TIF and tax incentive uh, because it's uh, a, a road to unhappy outcomes if we were to continue to do this. We're leveraging uh, too much on our, on our uh, uh, earnings tax, which 
can be, under certain circumstances, taken away through any number of mechanisms, which would be an existential threat to the city. We haven't had a unified planning document in a, a, a long time, and there is a perverse incentive even among rationally acting older people to use, and I won't, I'm deliberately not using the word abuse because it's a perverse incentive that's pre presented to them. If you were to imagine wards X, Y, and Z, and imagine ward, it just to use an analogy, wards X and Y are, are built out and thriving and have an expanding housing market, and, and Z has none of that, has a vacancy crisis, has a lot of things. Now, X and Y can say, well, let's all just not use TIF and tax abatement, and Z would be right to say, well, no, hold on, like, why would you turn off the faucet right before I get to come along, you know? But then, so X and Y would say, well, then let's all keep doing TIF and tax abatement as we always have. But X and Y have a perverse incentive to poach each other in that situation. One person could be like, no, my ward's doing pretty good. I'm not going to do Well, you know, guess what? Y is going to do that, and you're going to suffer the consequences for that. And that's what I mean. In economics, we say a perverse incentive is an incentive that makes you act against your own rational self-interest and the self-interest of the city in the long term because it's set up in such a way. So we need to reevaluate how we do TIF and tax abatement. But that has to come... Uh, I hesitate to say top down. It doesn't have to come top down, but that would be one way to do it. But we can't, uh, we can't continue to ignore it. Right. In this case, of uh, the San Luis Development Corporation had recommended against any abatement. Sure. And the alderman acted against it. So it's like the, even the top down measures coming from the development agencies, mostly under the mayor's sort of jurisdiction, isn't working. So it's clear something legislative should happen, right? Maybe. I am open to such a. But thing. also, yes. it's clear that a lot of the aldermen don't want to do something in their ward that's different unless somebody else does it unless all 28 start doing the same thing at the same time um, which is not happening right um, and i don't see a situation where it could coalesce and where that could start happening without some kind of outside first mover mm -hmm. i mean let's be let's be honest there, there's a reason that it hasn't happened let's not ignore the fact that it's unlikely to start happening just because one plucky young eighth ward alderman is going to come in and, and upset the apple cart there Did needs to be fundamental it? change I, know. I, keep going. I was going to ask oh, no, if you I'm identify not. as plucky. Uh, I don't I, on, on good days, yes. I'm. Okay. So, okay, so speaking of that, speaking of delayed gratification or, you know, uh, getting aldermen to vote against what you would maybe call, against what you would say their own interest is, what are you in support of the reduction of aldermen? Are you in support of the redistricting? What are your thoughts on that? Do you think it's really going to happen? Redistricting is going to happen regardless of reduction. Uh, I, I am notionally against the reduction of uh, aldermen from 28 to 14, uh, but as a matter of policy. It, it, like it is, it's the case that uh, I've not been sold on the efficiencies that are to be created by yeah. such a reduction. Uh, I am, by outlook, skeptical that uh, magically uh, we will... I mean, it, it's it's... One thing that bothers me is this idea that any unknowable externality about a, a policy that I am to propose should be assumed to have benign consequences. So this is going to be a radical and huge change, and everybody's saying, oh, yeah, well, you know, also the constituent service is part of the uh, job that the alderman always has. We're going to have that fixed by then. Until we demonstrate that we can have that fixed, you know, I see this as something that can be destabilizing. So I, I guess I'm less against reduction in wards than I am than I am not convinced that this will be a panacea okay so also following up a little bit on what Michael was talking about in terms of when are you acting with a citywide lens and when are you acting with an eighth ward lens sure I mean so one example that comes to mind with that would be so charter schools in the city at large have somewhat of a mixed record. Yes. In the Eighth Ward, there's a very what I would say most people consider to be a successful charter school. And what I mean, what do you envision? You know, what are your thoughts on charter schools? What do you kind of envision some of the role being in kind of addressing some of that mixed record, mixed legacy in the city? Sure. Uh, w when it comes to education, I, I have a, a young child, nine months yeah. uh, old, right. uh, and we're, you know, I, we have to fix not only for my child, but for the tens right. of thousands like him. Uh, I, when it comes to education, I defer to 
my eighth ward neighbors, Nora, Ryan, Susan, Turk, they led me pretty well, which is not to say that I march in lock, lockstep with anything. But on, on the role of charter school, you know, this is, this is something that is not an area of strong expertise for me, but I have really good advisement. Uh, to the larger question of yeah. uh, role of ward versus citywide. Right. I mean, it's simply the case that uh, if anyone sleeps at the switch on any one of those, it's uh, on either one of those, it's going to have consequences. The role of the eighth ward alder person is to absolutely address the legislative and uh, quality of life concerns of people in the eighth ward. But I believe that a thriving eighth ward exists within a thriving city. It's not the case that you can spit polish to a patent leather shine your ward and let the other city uh, fend for itself. There, there is no strong eighth ward without a strong city of St. Louis. Yeah. And so to those ends, you have to legislate in, you know, it's a rising tide lifts all boats thing. It's not the case that the eighth ward succeeds at the, at the detriment. It's not a zero sum game, in other words. I'm going to shift gears. Um, some people say that we, in the eighth ward, if we elect Paul Failer, we're not changing things much. We're replacing one former wrestler with another. Is it true you were a former wrestler? <laughs> yes, but a very mediocre one. Okay. And then following up on that. I did qualify for state one year. Ooh. I was, and, and, then did, right. and then did not place. Wait, Paul, remind us all where you grew up. I grew up in Wentzville, Missouri. Okay. Uh, I'm a third generation St. Louisan, but by the time I got to high school, we were out in western St. Charles County, but oh. I did hurry back as quick as I could. You're part of the broader metropolis. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the so, metropolitan statistical area. Yes, for sure. exactly. Um, the land where 89% of St. Louisans choose to live. Unfortunately, so. Yes. But to answer your question, uh, so what are the what do you what's one thing you think is very different between you and Steve Conway? I think that and one thing that might be similar. Sure. I, I'll start with the the similar one. Steve uh, and I have had probably several hundred conversations, uh, and I can count on the fingers of one hand, the number of political conversations we've ever had. We've had several hundred conversations about constituent services. Mm. Uh, I do think that uh, he's been a fantastic resource for the constituents of the 8th Ward as far as addressing their concerns and driving down crime in, in, in those ways, in, in use of uh, problem property. And he's, he's worked fantastically with Michelle Boston David, and in these ways I think everybody will give him a, a victory. Uh, politically, I don't know how many political conversations he and I have had, mm -hmm. and I'm not uh, deeply familiar with his voting record on the Board of Aldermen. I think that we are different generations politically and probably in macro and micro senses might not line up as much as we differ. That being said, I'm not sure. We don't have that many political conversations. So you can't, is there a specific example you could give of something you think at least you might differ with politically from him? Um, I mean, nothing really springs to mind. I'm, I'm not sure. There's, there's a, uh, I told the line is about constituent services and yeah. fiscal responsibility. I think also, you know, one thing that most people would give Conway credit for is crunching the ones and zeros. I'm not a CPA or, uh, you know, I've never worked in that uh, way before, but I, I admire him for that. Michael, what was a way that, I mean, you're familiar with both of us very deeply. What's, what's a way, I mean, I, I, I would really love to hear you answer right. this question. You've studied both of us. Well, or well, not studied, that seems <laughs> egotistical. <laughs> wow. But, uh, you're familiar with both of us, I'm well, sorry. There, there are files with both names in my filing cabinet. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Over the Preservation Research Office. Um, one, one thing I, I guess I could ask, it was on my list, is, um, you know, Conway, um, I remember when I was an 8th Ward constituent, he talked very critically about the fiscal impact of Paul McKee's Northside regeneration, but then in committee and on the floor voted for it and has basically supported any any change to it over the years with, without much question. Um, and some probably were looking to him as chair of ways and means to make some kind of signal that maybe this is a fiscal nosedive or a, or a, or a, a long dash for the city that ends in a, in a tragedy. Only, you know, only two aldermen ever voted against the first enabling statute, Antonio French and Terry Kennedy. So it's not to say there's some special scorn I have for Conway for, for being part of the, the other 25 who voted for it. That includes a lot of people. But where would a Paul Failer come in in something that big? Again, talking about scales, talking about you know what, what sure. scale of fiscal impact, scale of fiscal health. Um, Based on the data presented, there's a 
25 and 28 chance that Paul would have been for. I'm not sure. Like I, right. I, I was not presented the information to make that uh, right. uh, to make that right. distinction. It also has a little bit of the Iraq War quality with you know, lack of exit strategy. Yes. Amorphous, and it's now come down to a, a terminal sort of p sure. position of a 19 million dollar gas station. Right. It's in, in, in <laughs> Which is like about. 90% subsidized. A, a mutual friend of ours said something, this was eight years ago, that I've, I've remembered uh, uh, ever since, said that St. Louis is a deeply conservative city that appeals to progressive ideals only in times of great crisis and only uh -huh. in the language of the, broad, uh, the, the huge gesture. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've done, we did that with Pruitt Igo, we've done right. it with several other things. We also did it with the Arch, which I realized we had to raise 40 blocks of it. I think the Arch is actually really beautiful but it, you know it's, oh sorry so, right. it, so it is the case that uh the language of the grand gesture is not the way to advance progressivism it has to be kind of day in day out uh evinced by action and right. i'm the type of progressive where we uh don't measure progress in stated intention or you know good ideas but you measure progress in feet and inches Excellent. there is there is no other way to measure that wow. so if i have not brought my constituents what they want and need economically in terms of public safety, in terms of education, then I should be called in the carpet for that. To answer your question, I wasn't there at that meeting, so mm -hmm. I couldn't tell you what I would have voted for. Right. It's sort of foretold, though, in the, at the end of the pruitt Igo myth, this sort of the next time the city changes. Remember, Remember pruitt, pruitt Igo. Igo. Yes. And, and this idea of that large-scale development's coming again. I will should, tell you. We should critique it through the lens of yep, the when, equity message of that film when we wrote that and we were recording that we were thinking yeah. about that exactly yeah do you think that st louis has i mean do you think st louis has the kind of memory that it needs to have do you think that it's mm. people are remembering pruitt i'm not going to tell 317,000 people what they should remember i wish they would remember it more i don't know that i'm the person to tell people how they should remember anything I do. I, I think that we should be more cognizant of our history when our leaders make decisions. Very much. Yeah. That's fair. Yeah, I mean, I'm reminded of the, uh, the quote by the critic Lewis Mumford that a traditionalist is pessimistic about the future and optimistic about the past. When you're talking about conservative tendencies in local politics, um, a short kind of question I would have is, you know, one of the issues that's in the, in the air right now on the Board of Aldermen is, should the Board of Aldermen take the position of changing city law to decriminalize marijuana and some aldermen are saying that's not even a power they have others are saying we should be bold we should look to the future we should follow other cities where would an alderman failure fit into that i'm i'm all for if you know smoke them if you got them i, I don't care oh. if anyone smokes weed and if right as now. long as say again right now? I, yeah, <laughs> if, if you want I, I don't i don't personally do it but i I'm thought not, the rail was not smoking <laughs> I'm not in a position to tell anybody <laughs> else what to do. I, I know that the criticism of the marijuana decrim thing was that it would be toothless or unenforceable or right. would run right. countervening to state or to federal law. Right. I'm all about, I mean, nobody should spend a day in jail, much less prison for a nonviolent uh, uh, offense that's uh, of, of any type about substance abuse. I really think that substance abuse, uh, when you get to opioids and other things, should be treated as a public health issue and not as a criminal issue. You know, we so, have, oh, sorry. Please go ahead. I was going to say we have many people in St. Louis who do who do jail time for nonviolent offenses. Absolutely. So what and what role do you think the board of aldermen should play? Uh, at legislating. In oh, sorry. Legislating in such a way. Well, I mean, historically, the role that the board of aldermen played was to go down to the jailhouse and get their constituents out. This is not, you know, the most effective use of our time, but that's something that people can do. You can go advocate for your uh, your jailed or imprisoned uh, constituents. I mean, that's something that I would entertain uh, doing in, in a very direct way. And also legislating in such a way that uh, makes penalties for nonviolent uh, drug offense less. I mean, I, I would be part of any coalition that would want to do that and do that effectively. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, so, yeah. well, one thing that I'm just thinking about that is directly, I mean, so um, when you imagine, like, going down to the jail and advocating for someone's release, I mean, um, that was th there used to be aldermen uh, yeah. who, who had offices down there. I mean, that, that's what the aldermen would do. That's from uh, Stein's book. The, right, uh, right. Uh, Politics that, that they would, tradition. They would well, sorry, I mean, I just think what's so interesting about that is, you know, sort of one of the trends that's kind of swept kind of neighborhood groups um, in St. Louis is a model actually directly counter to that. And, th and that would be for, you know, I guess what we would call violent offenses um, and 
I personally struggle sometimes with the definition of nonviolent versus violent offenses, vis-a-vis -vis charging and other things like that. But you know, one of the tactics that I think SLMPD has advocated for heavily is that people from neighborhoods actually go to court to, to testify against victim their neighbors, impact statements and the type victim Im impact statements, et cetera. That's part it, of the tool set, the uh, neighbor or yeah. ownership model. Yeah. Uh, that's one, it's, a, you know. it's a heavy reliance on, on criminalization as, as, as the idea that an increased jail sentence would shift violent behavior. So what are your thoughts on that? Oh, well, I, when uh, that method has been employed uh, in the three neighborhoods of, and I can't swear that yeah. It's never, but since I've been paying attention, especially in the Shaw neighborhood, I mean, that has been uh, the, the, the outpouring of people wanting to do that and, and us making those vic victim impact statements have always been uh, for a very violent offense. Uh, yeah. And it's, there's blood on the ground and it's absolutely kind of clear cut. And it's not the case that we go around asking everybody to perjure themselves or to say something. It, it is from actual victims. I mean, I, I, I do, I, I share with you the concern that such a thing could be abused. Uh, but you know the the my kitchen knives could be abused that's not a reason to throw away my kitchen knives it is it, it's the case that i just make sure that we don't misuse my kitchen knives i mean to do away with that tool i think is would be irresponsible uh as would weaponizing that to artificially increase the incarceration of some liminal case but that that's simply not happened in our neighborhood it's it's always been somebody who's done something fairly heinous and the idea is that an increased jail sentence would would well, shift that behavior? The, well, the perception, and you would know better than I, I, I yeah. don't purport to be an, an expert, but the perception among some people is that this is the difference between incarceration of any type, uh, which some of my neighbors, and I don't m purport to speak for them, uh, would see as the thing that removes a threat from their neighborhood. Uh, that if the, the, the perception is that without this, uh, this person might get some kind of probation that would not interrupt a pattern of behavior. I, like I said, this is only for when there's something heinous done that's repetitive. Yeah. Uh, at least in, in my neighborhood, in an actual effect, and so I, so my neighbors, I would yeah. say, would think that this interrupts that pattern through some kind of uh, incarceration. And I'm I'm not yeah. for mass incarceration. This is a huge problem that we have sure. to uh, that we have to address. Sure. But if somebody, you know, knocks out four of my neighbors and steals their wallet, there has to be some kind of interruption to that. I mean, there's no way around it. Yeah, I think so. I think what sometimes that gets to though is the the larger idea of public safety, right? So we have a public safety committee, we have public safety budgeting, and, and primarily we think of that often public safety money as being for police, we think of it as being for prisons, um, and of course that's not necessarily what creates public safety, right? And I so agree that it has to be, you know, looked at holistically. You know, the, it goes down to, in, in this, uh, Representative Franks talks about this very eloquently, uh, solving these problems through root cause, but one thing that I've not understood or hasn't been explained to me is that why we can't do both. I mean, it is the fact that if, you know, if somebody's grandmother has a heart attack and you call 911 and they say, what do I do? And they say, uh, you know, more exercise and eat a better diet. That's, that's good to know and that's good to do. But really what I want to hear on that call is elevator legs. There's a, there's a car coming right now. We absolutely have to address root causes. That should be something that we allocate a lot of our time and resources to. We also have to make people physically safer. We have a crime rate that by any standard has gone up, especially in the last 18 months. Uh, we can't not address it. I've got a question, just to shift gears. Sure. But it's something, when I, I mentioned I was interviewing you this week, two, two people asked about something that happened on the Canvas Trail, but their knowledge of it really only came through Facebook. They weren't <laughs> there. They didn't hear it at the local tavern or coffee shop. <laughs> I so I, mean, I want to. I want to. You can say whatever you want about the incident. That, sure. that it's well documented. I've, I had to sit through and read all these things to catch up on it because I don't look at Facebook very sure. often. But in the 21st century, you know, Facebook can make a, a tiny little thing that happens into a huge, like, social force. Where if you like Paul Failer, I guess you you look at it one way, like, oh, he, he commented the right way. And if you don't, you can read all kinds of things into sure. it, like, oh, the tone, the language. Right. How do you sort through that if you get elected to alderman? Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think this, these issues are abating, you know, where we have instant kind of feedback loops on behavior that right. an increasingly narrow p part of the population are participating in. I mean, I, I don't right. look at Facebook anymore. Yeah. No, I agree I with feel you. Facebook is uh, terrible to I look at. I feel digitally it. disenfranchised sometimes. but <laughs> Sure. I feel the same way. You know, I, I, the 
the incident in question uh, was a situation where intersectionality kind of removed me from uh, what was an uncomfortable and conversation. And you don't mean Thurman at Clem by intersection. Uh, no. <laughs> what are you talking that's, about? That's a corny joke, Michael. Uh, sorry. <laughs> For those of you who One. couldn't catch up with that, Michael just named an intersection in the eighth. <laughs> Though a fairly prominent uh, Yeah, one. I was going to say a great intersection, yeah. I would say. Fantastic. Yeah. Used to be a laundromat there. Right. Oh. So, so, inter so you were, oh, intersectionality removed you from right. the situation. Um, but I guess this isn't unfamiliar to you as, as oh, no, no. the People. Neighborhood Association um, Committee Chairman. Were you Vice President of Shaw? I was second Vice President. So, so if the President and the Vice President were traveling on the same plane and we were to lose them, <laughs> there would be a continuation of, of, of leadership. Second Vice All President right. is underrated and very important. Right. So, so I guess m my question, follow up on that is, sure. in terms of intensity, that, you know, the Facebook thing looks intense, but I know how neighborhood associations are. Absolutely. Which has been more intense? Or do you feel that? Facebook or the Neighborhood Association? I would say recently, just because of the situation that we're in and the, the uh, looming nature of the election, I would say that the, some of the uh, arguments that I've seen and obviously not participated in on Facebook have been probably more intense. I also think that being at a remove, I don't think that, uh, I mean, I've seen, I've seen fist fly at a, at a ward meeting before oh. on several occasions. In the 8th? Yes. Oh. <laughs> oh, no, and, and in others. That's, uh, why, I, I, I that's why Steve Smith's not participating right. any longer. Oh, no, I, I won't denigrate the others by, by calling by name. Don't, no, I've, I've seen people, you know, come to blows. But it, I think that as far as casual and far-reaching, uh, uh, just uh, cruelness is the wrong word, but just uh, insensitivity to others, it's very easy to do that from behind a uh, screen and to type uh, that out. People type things that they would never say face-to-face. -face. I mean, I think that there's a lot more. Uh, commonality that we can find when we sit down and we look at each other and we talk and there's a lot more civility that comes because right. of that great is there anything um, we didn't talk about tonight so i think we we promised a lightning round do we have yes. enough time okay. Okay. this is a okay. true lightning round this will round. be in i okay. i okay you know the board of Baltimore doesn't have a lightning round right <laughs> i don't know what this is testing but i'll, I'll go i'll go along with it uh Okay, so if you, what it's testing currently is... Does a lightning round mean that I answer quickly to a rapid-fire set of questions? It does mean that, although, for the record, I will state that it does not mean you will be struck by lightning. Gotcha. <laughs> no matter how I answer. No matter how you answer, although we could work that in. Okay. Good to know. Eighth Ward business most frequently visited. Say again? Eighth Ward business that you visit the most, most frequently. Uh, and honestly, schnooks. Okay. A political hero and a non-political hero. Friendliest store in town. It's true. A uh, political hero and a non-political hero? Yes. Nationally, globally, whatever. Whoever has inspired you. Pass. Uh, who will be president in 2020? Who will be elected <laughs> president of the United States of America? Not Board of Aldermen. Way too soon to tell. No one knows. Who will be president of Board of Aldermen in 2019? Pass. <laughs> <laughs> Smart. Uh... Favorite pavilion in Tower Grove Park? Mm, Turkish, obviously. <laughs> wow. Tur you don't like the Turkish pavilion. I do love it, but... <laughs> but, <laughs> that, but you, but you one think you one's better? No, no, actually, no. I, I'm going to... I was going to say you passed on the presidency of the Board of Aldermen. You didn't pass <laughs> on that question. There's, there's absolutely There are three no people who are going to vote against you. No. <laughs> because they hate the Turkish pavilion? Yeah. Nice try, Michael. <laughs> Not true. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, North-South Metrolink. Pipe Dream... Or realistic. Very, project. very expensive, crucial thing that must happen. Okay. But very expensive. Very <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's the, the people that think that we can wave a wand and do it uh, need to wake up to the fact that we're going to need uh, some federal investment, and that's going to take getting Trump out of office. It's going to take a lot of different things. But it is absolutely right. crucially uh, essential that we uh, shore up our public transit infrastructure. Okay. Last one. What does growing up... Not primarily, but somewhat in Wentzville and coming to St. Louis City. What are three? What are the three biggest differences? Population size, population density, and built environment. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it, Wentzville is very different than the city of St. Louis. The Incredibly three things different. You, I, I think I should have phrased that in a more emotional way. Things you learned, or things, mm. think differences to you. Uh, the beautiful friendships I've made, the fellowship that I have when sitting around tables like this and, and good neighbors actually without any irony the uh especially in the three neighborhoods that make up the eighth ward there is an intentionality to people that choose to live uh in 
these close together places and there are uh, opportunities for fellowship and for uh, interaction that spring up completely unplanned and there are friendships that are made from that. That is very important to me and I've cherished it. Seems like a place to end unless Michael has any more. Uh, unless we uh, want to say favorite intersection. In uh, no, short yeah. one. Would you, unilater you, you unilaterally remove the street closure on the 8th Ward side of the Thurman underpass? Wait, say again? Would you unilaterally <laughs> remove the street closure on the 8th Ward side of the Thurman underpass? With, uh, on, on my own authority? Because I... Just well, you could put a bill through. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think that's that's uncontroversial. You're talking about at Thurman and... Thurman and under the... Y yeah, no, this, this, this has been something that, uh, that people have been calling for. I, I imagine, you know, with any kind of uh, change in street configuration, there are going to be people who hate that, and I very much want to listen to you if you hate that. <laughs> but, I mean, it, but it's not the case that we get to pick that, and now it's uh, Botanical Heights that's saying that they don't want it. But right. I, I think it's fairly popular with my oh, neighbors. That's a different ward, so... That's what I'm saying. But so you, you that's why I can't unilaterally you know, do anything. But mm -hmm. it is the case that, uh, uh, that this is something I'd explore. This is something that I would poll opinion on. This is, I mean, and that's the way that I would uh, go about the business of Alderman. It's, it's not the case that you approach uh, eighth ward residents. They're very yeah. savvy people. You don't approach them with the answers. <laughs> oh, no, I'm not, I'm I, not being I've learned that from hosting the show. Yes. I mean, you go to them, you poll their opinions, and you try to find some kind of consensus. I think that anybody who does a successful job uh, of anything in the eighth ward or anywhere in the city polls constituent, finds consensus, and, you know, soothes hurt feelings and... All these other things. Well, that's a great spot to end, I think. All right. All right. Yes. Thank you so much, Paul, for coming on the Royale Political Wire. Thank right. you for having me. And uh, everybody, be sure to stay tuned. Uh, next week, come down to the Royale on Wednesday for the actual political brawl itself, the actual open debate in the bar room itself. No fists. Yeah, I am. I will be the no. sergeant. No at fists, arms. just no fists. Three by five note cards. Write <laughs> your questions down. That's right. If you have any questions, good penmanship so Steve can submit read them. them. Submit them to us. Yeah, just submit it to us. Look us up on Facebook. I'm sure you can track us down. Yeah. If you can't, I'm not sure I can help you. But uh, yeah, let us know what you want, and be sure to subscribe to the podcast and rate us if you can on your preferred uh, format that you get your podcasts in. And I'd like to thank Paul and Michael and Maureen. We will uh, be seeing you next week. 